electric roo here. Now I really didn't make any audio files cry, but I did something that a lot of people probably wouldn't approve of in the high end market because actually I'm just a regular guy. I have some old realistic Mach 2 speakers and I have recone the uh, surrounds on the woofers because they were kind of falling apart but they still were kind of out of spec with the sound so I replaced the crossover capacitors now I'll give you a quick walkthrough with some pictures because I'm sure this has been all over the internet but I do want to point out the thing that I did was replace the original non uh, polarized capacitors with new non polarized capacitors so there's a lot of controversy over all that that a good polyfilm capacitor you really need to do that but you have to figure really on a on a vintage speaker you want to maintain that sound that was engineered for and I have to wonder if the engineers designed everything with the ESR of those non-polarized capacitors involved in this circuitry. So I want to take a quick look at that and what I did with just a few pictures and how to do it if you have a set of these speakers. But also I want to point something out. Down in the description there's a link and actually there are three parts to the article and I think it's really good because it goes over an actual testing with real equipment as far as equipment wise I can't account for everybody's ears because mine are old and they don't work good but that's why I have a tone control on all my amps but the author proves that those expensive forty fifty dollar capacitors are no better than the cheaper capacitors now some people are going to argue that point some people be upset over that I'm not here to do that it just is what it is and I wanted to point that out so here you have the old uh, realistic uh, Mach 2 speakers I think later on they sold them under the Optimus brand also and on the front here you you see the different uh, the, where the controls and the uh, speakers are so the first thing you're going to do is take the tweeter out with the four screws and when you do that if you mark all the wiring just put a piece of masking tape on it mark where they came from you won't have any problems so you remove those four screws pull out the tweeter and mark the wires the next thing you're going to do is you want to remove the woofer and you want to be careful with that. You have screws on the outer ring that you need to remove that beauty ring. Once you take that out, you'll have access to the screws holding the woofer in itself. And you want to remove them. When you remove that, be really careful pulling off the uh, connectors on those speakers especially on the woofer because after I put everything together I said oh great the woofer wasn't working one of the speakers so I removed the woofer again and I found that uh, the connection on the terminal strip just wasn't right maybe from years of vibration and use that that wire it that braided wire coming from the cone is is really thin so I had to uh, Resolder that on and then everything was fine once you remove your woofer now don't set it upside down because you'll be setting on the foam surrounds unless you set it inside of that beauty cone which you can do and set it straight down because it'll take up the slack uh, next thing you want to do is uh, if you look inside where the tweeter was you can see the crossover board but the way they designed this, not everything plugs into the crossover board. Some of it does, and some of it goes back to the uh, 
speakers, some of it goes back to the controls. So if we remove the uh, screws on the controls and gently hang that and as you disconnect the plug-in connectors on the crossover board, some of them are marked where they go as but but mark those wires again that you pulled that off that was per se the uh, mid-range connection uh, going to the crossover board mark that wire and as trace those wires back to the controls take a picture of it if you have to but as you remove the wires from the controls mark where they went on that control once you do that you can take out the screws there are four screws on the crossover board two in the top two in the bottom the top two go through those inductors and the bottom two once you do that you can remove those screws you can drop that whole board out stick it on the bench replace the caps for what you whatever you want to put in there now I do have a selection of um, poly metalized caps that but I decided to go with the old original non polarized well, that was my choice but it's interesting again read over those three articles that that fella made in that that I left the link in the description and he goes over you know the differences and I often just wonder in them old speakers if they had uh, considered the ESR of the capacitors when they made the crossovers. I don't know. And a lot of people say, oh, it changed. My sound changed. I put this capacitor in, that capacitor in. Well, you did change something. You put something different in. Was it what the original intent was on those speakers? I don't know. But as long as you use the exact same values and replace what's in there I think you'll be okay I'm happy with the sound as it brought those speakers back up in spec and you know what look at me those non-polarized capacitors are gonna outlast me so it'll be somebody else's problem anyway by the way at least three caps were out of spec on each crossover board and they read high. They were higher than what they were supposed to be. Now someone mentioned to me, gee, that's funny that they would be high. I figured they'd be low. But I'll tell you what, I have a transistor radio collection and I've replaced a lot of caps in the transistor radios. And that is the case. When I pull them out, the ones that are bad, they actually tend to increase in capacitance. I don't know why. Or they're open. One of the two. So this is what it is and take a look again at uh, the photos I supplied here and you can see how easy it is to work on these speakers so other than that have a good day